Um, my name is Shelby Panina Allen. I've been a nurse for eight years now. Uh, my specialty is cardiac. So I'm Tessa Brock. Um, I got into nursing straight out of high school. My name is Megan. I got into healthcare. My mom is a nurse and my parents have both worked in healthcare since I was small. So we have a few clips for you on medical shows. So we're gonna we're gonna get started with the first one here. Code blue and ED Alpha. Love that he said that they yelled a code blue, didn't even see them feel for a pulse or anything. She just clapped. There's normally, I mean, obviously we check for a pulse and then if she has a pulse, then we'll start checking blood sugar and, you know, try to figure out all the reasons this person might have collapsed. What exactly is a code blue? So code blue means that we have um, either have respiratory arrest or cardiac arrest. They're, you know, calling for the crash cart because it has all the supplies that we need to run a code. So that means that we can intubate a patient. That means we can give medications. We can shock a patient if it, if it is advised. But code blue means patient is either completely stopped breathing or they have lost a pulse or both. I'm not getting a pulse. Pause. <laughs> as soon as he said, as soon as he felt there was no pulse, they should have started CPR at that moment. You feel for a pulse and you go for compressions. Yes. That's it. There's too many people around. You don't have to call for help. You don't have to pull out your phone. No. You've got three doctors right there. Mm -hmm. You should have started CPR. The other doctor could have could have called the rest of it. Yes. No pulse, no breathing. You could, you should have started CPR. Start compressions, you're running the code. I've never run a code. Do you want an amp bicarb? He's in charge. One thing that I really do appreciate about it is, you know, the doctor, he took charge and he said, you're gonna run the code. Whenever we do have code, we, we do need to assign roles so that everybody had to clear role to know exactly what you're gonna be doing um, and who's gonna be making the calls. Because if you have that many doctors all yelling orders and whatnot to people, it can get really confusing and detrimental for the patient. So when there's a code, usually we all have a job. Mm -hmm. So we run it, we say we run it like a code. So we all know ahead of time there's a recorder, there are about five jobs. So the person who's running the code will say like, call a code, you be the recorder, you're on meds, you're on compressions, you're on breath. So if you will, before you start your shift, you already know what your position is if there's a code today. Megan might be assigned compressions, I might be assigned the recorder, this person assigned to push meds, this person is assigned to um, comfort family in that time. You know when you start your shift what your role is. Blue and AD Alpha! Get out of here. Start compressions, you're running the code. I've never run the code. It's way too you chill. Run bicarb? He's in charge. Hey, anesthesia. Pause. <laughs> um, there's no argument. If that physician says ampibicarb and he's fooling with his ACLS how-to, <laughs> somebody, whoever is assigned to meds, is given that amp. Because there's a cart that you pull up. So there's what's called a crash cart. So whenever somebody crashes or we have to perform CPR, they'll roll the cart over. The cart has all the meds, all the things that we need. Everything. It has the Ambu bag, which is for the respirations. The IO, it which is like the bone IV that goes into the bone. Um, it has everything in it. So that nurse that's standing there looking side-eyed, <laughs> he would have already been drawing it up. He wouldn't have cared that he's, I mean, an experienced nurse is gonna be like, these are the steps of ACLS. I'm just waiting to hear it from the doctor to say, give. And as soon as he heard give, he would have been pulling it up and giving it. I might even already He would have, have probably already been, he would have had hands on the patient to access a site mm -hmm. while he's doing compression. So he's doing the wrong job. Yeah, he's just side-eyeing, but that's fine. Page anesthesia. What is the first question you ask in code? Rhythm. What's a rhythm? PEA. Should we shock? No, we can't. A rhythm's not shockable. Get me water, Vepi. When they say PEA, so a PEA is a pulseless electrical activity. So what happens whenever we have a PEA is you will see electrical activity on the EKG, which this one did not have anything on there, um, and they said, oh, PEA. So that means that whenever I see electrical activity going on, there's no pulse. And so that was a very, a big misinformation there just because um, it looked like she was an asystole, which in that case, like they said, no, you don't shock asystole, and then you would do epi. 
So epinephrine is uh, a medication, it's adrenaline essentially. You think of epi whenever we get like an EpiPen. So if you have a patient with that has a severe allergic reaction, that is the medication that we use in that instance. It's another word for adrenaline. What is the first question you ask in code? Rhythm. What's rhythm? PEA. Uh, stop. <laughs> His hand should not have left that patient's chest. It would have said analyzing rhythm and then he could leave the chest, but until it says that, you don't. And it's not even showing PEA. It's showing nothing. It's showing asystole. And also those leads yeah. are probably on the floor. That's yeah. what it looks like. I <laughs> don't see enough leads on the patient to even get a rhythm, but. So the wires that they put on your, the patches that connect to the wires that they put on your chest to get your heart rhythm. There, mm -hmm. I see one, but that's TV. I think that flat line is what is the most hilarious <laughs> though. <laughs> She's flatlining, but it's PEA. Yeah. <laughs> when somebody flatlines, that's it. You can't shock them back. You would have to do compressions until you get some sort of rhythm back. Um, an actual rhythm, VTAC, VFib, usually are what you get back and then it'll shock. Um, when you put on an AED, it gives you instructions, continue doing compressions, um, clear the patient, analyzing rhythm. As soon as that rhythm analyzes, you're back on that chest, if unless it advises a shock. Should we shock? No, we can't. The rhythm's not shocked. Well, get me one of Epi. Make those compressions harder and faster. Prepare to innovate. They had the crash cart, but it was on the side. It's time to call the code. No! This is my code. You gave me this code. She's 21 years old. Harder, man. You need to feel the ribs crack. <laughs> okay, pause. <laughs> Those compressions are weak sauce. <laughs> weak. Weak. That's just... I mean, I have seen nurses straddle a patient to give compressions. I'm short, so a lot of times I either had to drop the bed or stand on my tiptoes and was like, somebody get me a stool, hop on the stool and do them because you wanna be, have the upper half of your body over the patient to throw your body weight into it. We did have a student. We ran a simulation that was so much fun. And this student, she couldn't figure out how to get the bed down. Like something wasn't working in the room. This student was like, I'm gonna get on the bed. And she got on the bed, straddled the patient and was doing these compressions. Like I thought she was gonna push the mannequin mm -hmm. through the bed. And that's what we're looking for. Not the little Yeah, boop, it's boop, never a pretty play. sight. No. It's not pretty. We're saving a life here. And the hard thing is, is it really is up to the doctor to say when to mm -hmm. stop. If they're new and they wanna keep going because maybe this is the first patient that they ever lose, you might go a little longer than an experienced physician who is weighing risk and benefit in his head and is like, it's been 26 minutes. Yes, we may be able to bring her back, but she will never live a full life. And do we want the family to have to make that ethical decision or do we make that for them? So there's a lot of ethics involved in codes and calling time of death and stop time and all of those things. I'm not giving up. I said that's enough. Who <laughs> we got a pulse? You saved your life. Her end tidal CO2 is less than 15 for the entire code. That doesn't necessarily yes. mean that... Yes, it does. She's been without oxygen to her brain for 26 minutes. Congratulations, you got her heart beating again, but she's brain dead. I think another hard thing to watch about that was just how disingenuous that other doctor was towards, you know, the others in the code. Um, it can be, it seems like he's a little dis, uh, disincentivized. You know, he's seen a lot of things. And that is something that can happen in our world is that you get so used to seeing things that, you know, you're just like, just call it already and then let's move on. Because, you know, whenever we do code somebody and somebody does pass away, we have to go then move on straight to the next room. It, it can be this vicious cycle 
at the end of the day too, he doesn't necessarily know she's brain dead. She most likely does have an anoctic brain injury because she, like he said, she did go without oxygen for 26 minutes, but there's not just one mold that fits every single per patient of how the outcomes were going to be. I just wish he would have been a little bit more, you know, proud of him that he ran the code, he kept going, and he did get a pulse back. And then we we make decisions from there. You know, we try to see what's going on, slowly um, activate the patient if we can, get the family on board, what do they want to do? Because at the end of the day, he owed it to save her life because she was young, she didn't have a, a do not resuscitate order, so he did his due diligence. Currently, I'm the clinical coordinator in the nursing department, and I was at a clinical site, and we had a situation that was really hard for our students. So we have gone through our CPR education. They know about running codes. They know about kind of the basics of how it goes, but we had a student that experienced one in real life. So in real life, they're not as pretty and clean as you know we make it out to be in the books. And we had a situation where we were running a code on a 78-year-old woman, and they called their child who was the GPOA. Yep. And the DPO said, no, save my mom. You need to save my mom. You need to save my mom. This code lasted for about 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And by the end, my student was upset and was like, why are they doing this to her? This is unethical. This is horrible. The families kept telling them to continue. Uh, it took the doctor to have to step away and call the, their child and explain it. Mm -hmm. But it was this learning moment for the student where they were like, I thought that, you know, when we say do everything, that means that I love my family member. And if we don't do everything, that we don't love them. But they had this moment where they were like, you know what, sometimes not doing everything for grandma is the might best. be best. And so you can't teach yeah. that through this type of a, you I experience. And that. I don't think people that are non non-medical, non-health care, understand the ramifications of what happens after the code. Because they make it look we like We have this. cracked your chest and ribs. She's, what they say, 21. She may recover, she may be fine, she may be brain dead, stuck in the bed. Whatever that is, even if it would have been two minutes and they got her back, her chest is broken. Her mm -hmm. ribs are broken. Exactly. She is going to have so many months of rehabilitation after this code that is it worth it so when you think about grandma who's 78 and we have just broke every bone in her upper body there's a high level of pneumothorax or hemothorax that can happen mm -hmm. which means their lung collapse because you break the ribs so the rib can puncture the lung um there's so many things that happen after this everybody thinks oh we coded them they're back everything's good because they get up they, and walk in these shows they wake up and they're like oh i'm feeling so i'm so better. hungry like they're in so much pain yeah. afterwards mm -hmm. yes they can breathe maybe they can talk maybe they're not brain dead but there's so much recovery that happens afterwards i always encourage my patients once they're over a certain age a dnr is best because this is what this is actually what's going to happen if i have to code you and if you are okay with that fine sign sign full code i'll do cpr all day long but if you don't want to go through this recovery process i suggest you sign a do not resuscitate and i always tell people that does not mean do not treat we will treat you up until the point that your heart stops and you have no respiration at that point we stop treating you but we will give you all the medicine all the interventions that we can um, so I think sometimes TV shows give that false sense of reality yeah. where they're going to do CPR and they're coming right back to life just like they were yesterday. Um, and that's not the case. What would you say to someone who's interested in healthcare? I would say make sure you you have a passion for people. Um, you have to have a certain level of caring for the people to want to treat them, to want to learn and to want to do better. What would you say to someone who's interested in healthcare? So I was actually thinking about this on my way to work today, that I am the one out of my peers that loves my job. By getting this degree, by having my nursing degree, I get to wake up every day and be a part of somebody else's life and impact them in such a cool way. And I think that there's so many different aspects of healthcare. So even if a 12 hour shift on the floor taking care of seven or eight patients isn't your jam, there's always something for somebody. Uh, Look at us now, we're teaching. We're teaching. There are nursing positions where you can work from home. You can work in a Fortune 500 company as an occupational health nurse, or you can get down and dirty in the ER. But like working in healthcare, you really get to make a difference. Thanks for watching. 
A big thank you to Shelby, Tessa, and Megan for joining us today and sharing their expertise. Nurses make a big difference in our lives, and nursing is in high demand right now. Being a nurse, you can make about $60,000 starting out, and it can definitely go up from there. And if you want to learn more about nursing, check out your local technical college. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and comment. YouTube Analytics says only 1% of you are subscribed right now, so make sure to hit that button, and we'll see you next time.